here we go. Thank you for everyone who has been waiting patiently for us um, while we wrangled uh, the changes in Zoom and Facebook and all sorts of things. I'm um, Aussie Indie author and illustrator of Steampunk, Victorian Mysteries and Fantasy. And my name's Karen J. Carlisle and I'll be uh, watching for um, if you've got any questions in the comments there. I'll just bring that up right now. And with me, oh, 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 turn off the mentioning. Okay. So with me is Michael Pryor. He's traditionally published Australian author of The Laws of Magic, The Extraordinaires, and many other steampunk and non steampunk uh, uh, stories. We've got Ged Maybury. He's traditionally and indie author, uh, Australasian steampunk author, originally from New Zealand, now living in Queensland. So we've got a few Aussies here today. We've got Sharon. Uh, she's just written her first uh, steampunk fantasy book, um, The uh, Hemlock Soames and the Water Horse. Um, and we've got uh, Jeff Genge from the Isley Wastelands of Prince Edward Island, Island in the east part of Canada. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open it up and uh, Michael, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Sure. Yep. My name's Michael Pryor and uh, I'm a writer, which means I've got the best job in the world. We appreciate that. And I've, uh, I've published 39 novels over 20 oh, something years. My first novel came out in 1996. I write mostly for young adults and, uh, and for younger kids as well. Short stories, I've written 60 plus short stories and a lot of them are for grown-ups. I'm also one of the editors of Orealis, Australia's fantasy and science fiction magazine. Okay, and next we've got Ged Maybury. Oh, you need me to talk about myself? You Give me 20 minutes. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, I started writing in uh, about uh, 1994. My first book was published in 1996. It was called Time Twister. And it actually briefly held the New Zealand record for the largest print run for any first time author in New Zealand ever. And then I lost my record. Mm -hmm. And so a whole string of children's science fiction books poured out of me through the next decade or so. Um, I'm up to about 14 published on paper books with uh, Scholastic and a few other companies and uh, about uh, ooh, 1995, 96, I switched to writing comedy. I have a series called um, the, uh, what's it called? The Horse Apples series. <laughs> How could I forget that word? Horse apples, um, crab apples, pig apples. And finally I put out dinosaur apples just about a year or so ago. Unfortunately, I'm digital. But somewhere in there, um, about uh, more than a decade ago, I suddenly switched to writing steampunk and I finally got my entire six book series out in digital format just a few years ago. It's called the Stonewind Sky series. Cool. So then we've got uh, Jeff Genge. I always forget your last name, Jeff. <laughs> okay, um, can you tell us a bit about yourself? Uh, well, uh, I am a relatively a new writer compared to your guests. Uh, uh, my, I and I co-write with my wife, Michelle. Um, we published uh, two books in our steampunk adventure series, uh, The Terror Obscura Chronicles. And uh, we're working on a third book this winter. Excellent. And Sharon, do you want to say anything or do you want to just sit? And she hasn't got, uh, hasn't unmuted. I think I'll just sit, thanks. Because okay, I must have then cleared a stowaway. I did meet the gate crash. That's okay. <laughs> if you so, ask her any questions, make sure you know the answers. You might have to answer for me. <laughs> okay, so I'm Karen J. Carlisle, and I've written, um, I'm currently writing my sixth book. So I haven't been around that long either, um, Jeff. Um, my first one was in 2015, and I've got a three a book series called The Adventures of Viola Stewart, which is sort of a steampunk towards the gas lamp, lamp, lamp end. So it's got um, mummies and curses and illusionists and Jack the Ripper. And then I've done a Department of Curiosities, which is the first in the series of a steampunk adventure. And the other one I do is a cosy mystery that's not, it's more fantasy and not too steampunk. So that's a bit about me. Okay, so there's probably a few people here, well, quite, probably quite a few people here who are watching this that don't know what steampunk is. So, 
Um, they, they, it's often said you ask 101 steampunks what it is and you'll get 101 different um, answers. I've been in the steampunk community for about 13 plus years, so I probably have a slightly different, different definition than everyone else. So, um, Jeff, what, what is steampunk to you and how did you get into well, you know, I suppose it has been a slow, gradual build uh, for a, a long part of my life. I, I'm not, um, I'm not uh, a full-blooded uh, cosplayer, steampunk uh, maker, uh, but I've always loved that anachronistic aesthetic uh, in books and movies and everything. Uh, I'm, and I, I kind of live it a bit as well. I'm a man who surrounds himself with a lot of old technology. And, uh, and so um, when we decided we, uh, we were going to write this series, there was, there was just no doubt that that was going to be the, the patina that it would have, the, 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 that it would just inevitably have that steampunk feel to it. So for me, uh, I would have to say that steampunk uh, represents... Um, you know, for me, a lot of it is about the optimism I see in it. Uh, I see it as a as a as a, a a genre that is brimming with optimism and hope, um, and uh, I think that's always drawn me to it. Okay, so Michael, yeah, what would your what would your definition of steampunk be, and how did you get around to doing it? Yeah, having having been involved with writing steampunk for a number of years, my idea of definition has gone backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. And I, I, I tend to rule things in rather than rule things out. I'm inclusivist rather than exclusivist. But my current definition goes something like this, that the uh, steampunk is uh, stories uh, with a Victorian Edwardian sensibility about them, but with some speculative elements. I think that's pretty concise and reasonably inclusive definition. I don't think many people would look at that and say, yeah, but what about? Because if they say, yeah, what about? I'll say, yeah, of course, include that as well. Now, I, I got involved with reading steampunk, uh, I, into writing it through reading it, which is the way most of my writing goes. And I first read what you might call proto steampunk way back in the 70s when I read Harry Harrison's A Transatlantic Tunnel. Hurrah! Still one of the best uh, steampunk novels, even though it, came, it was published before the, the term was coined. And I do also remember picking up, uh, picking up The Anubis Gates by um, da, 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 Tim, 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 Tim. Tim Powers. Tim Powers, Powers, of course, one of my favourite authors and the name just, I picked that up when it was first published. I opened it, I thought, oh, this is my sort of stuff. I loved it and I read steampunk as much as I could. But when I began writing, writing steampunk was always going to be something that I was trending towards. And I got there eventually, the, the first novel, 1996, my first steampunk novel was 2006. So I learned a bit of the writing business before I launched Holus Bolus into a historical fantasy steampunk six book series, The Laws of Magic. We see that behind me there. And it, yeah, it's just such fun. I, I endorse what Jeff was saying that it, uh, it, it is a lot of fun. There's a lot of optimism. I mean, you can still critique imperialism and coloni colonialism within the framework, but it was, uh, was an era where things were looking up and uh, being, being able to bring that sense of brio or uh, the enthusiasm into stories. Yeah, I think that's a lovely balance for some of the more dystopian books that are around at the moment. Yeah, I would agree with that too. Yeah. And Jed. Yes. Yes. Why? Why steampunk? Um, probably I'll just tell you the story. I joined, I acquired myself a, a Google address email address and that led me to Google Groups. So on my very first night I'm poking around in Google Groups and what should show up but a little group called Steampunked. And I thought, what is this? You know, so I dived in, I was reading what these guys were saying to each other and they were creating a steampunk video game for computers. This is like 19, uh, sorry, 2007. And so it was all very new and interesting. And I thought, 
airships traveling between these uh, sort of landscapes that were floating up in the sky, uh, a la uh, the, the Yes LP cover of, you might Yay. remember that. Um, but I joined and I said, look, I'm a writer. So if you have any trouble with you know, the story elements in your video game, I might be able to help you to sort of build the world and, and make the logic of why people are traveling from place to place in their little airships and what they're trading and what risks and dangers and, and benefits they're going to gain from the experience. And they go, oh, that's great, that's great. And then next minute I wrote a chapter and I posted it to them. <laughs> the day, next day I wrote another chapter and the next day I wrote another chapter and boom, I was hooked, you know, and the guys were saying lovely things about it. Um, and that led to book one, I actually have a copy of, oh, reflections there i'll try and get it in so you can across the storm wind sky and, and you sent yep. me a copy of that because i couldn't find it um yeah actually this is slightly different to your one okay you know, cover and stuff this is the very first you. one and this is one of the rarest books in the world i've only made six of these i hand made them <laughs> oh gosh <laughs> okay well i, I um I came in sort of via the costuming because I've been doing costuming and medieval reenactment and stuff since oh, the very, very early 90s. And I got to a point where I was hand making everything and then I went, oh, I've done everything. I'm looking for something else. And of course, I've always loved the aesthetic and a big, a big reader of Sherlock Holmes and all that sort of stuff. And um, so we started doing this Victorian thing with a um, bit of a twist and then found out in about 2006, seven, that it was a thing. And then we didn't know it was a thing and there was other people that did this. So I came in then to the community and we've been playing steampunk locally here in Adelaide and around the world with different people. We've been to Omaru in New Zealand. Oh. We were going to go to Lincoln, but it didn't because of COVID. And um, I've, we've got friends in Tucson who do book clubs and stuff. So we're doing all that sort of stuff. And of course, I got to a point in my work where I had to leave for health reasons. And they said, do what you've always wanted to do. And I said, well, I've always wanted to write. So I thought, I'll start writing. And I was planning on doing some sort of fantasy or, or something like that. And it turned out to be steampunk. So it was more Victorian fantasy, but less fantasy and more other stuff. And then it turned into mysteries as well. So that's how I got round to it. Um, so there, that's that's my story. So yeah. And Sharon, do you want to say anything or are you going to not? No. Okay. All right. Um, I just so followed you, Karen. <laughs> yep. I followed um, you in your little footprints. <laughs> um, so basically, for people who don't know steampunk, it's not just um, books, it's music, it's art, it's um, events, it's it's a very maker's ethic. Um, and it's basically what if uh, in Victorian times that we didn't go diesel and electronic and our steampunk, a steam or cog technology just got sort of better and better. It doesn't have to be in Victorian times, though a lot of times it is, and we'll get onto that a bit later. Um, okay, and we've got a question in a second. Um, so we might do the one more thing about thing about the. Yeah, okay, we'll go into the question actually. So Bill's here, and he said, "Have authors seen a decline in interest in steampunk from the publishers and consumers?" Who wants to answer that one? Probably Michael. Uh, probably <laughs> it. it Put it this way i think it's peaked and plateaued rather than peaked and declined uh, and there's just lots of other stuff out there but it does mean that the the cream rises to the top there's more cream so there's more top if you get what i mean yeah what about you ged because you you've done trade publishing in the past before oh yes i'm wondering whether i'm cream i think i might just be the milk of the curds or something <laughs> I haven't risen to the top of the steampunk world yet in terms of, you know, sales and visibility and stuff. I, I write good, you know, no dispute about that. The fact that um, I had a publisher in New Zealand who just published every damn thing I wrote for one and a half decades straight, that was um, evidence enough, I think. And what about but, you? I can't, I can't really answer about publishers except to say that I had an agent for a while and she got me into a publisher, um, a young chap that was just doing a startup. Um, what were they called? Satellite Books. And he actually published my first book, 
which I waved around in a minute. But, and that's the one that you've got, Karen. Yeah. And he collapsed. He, he didn't manage to get book two and book three completed. And this business, that happened a year or two ago, didn't it? And since then, um, I had a another agent and then she met me at an event one day and said no no I don't want to represent you at all uh, I'm not interested in any of the stuff that you write and so bam I was like ah okay. and I haven't got a publisher so I published them myself damn it yeah. um, so I'm not sure whether publishers are still supporting or whether they're yeah. fading on it what about you Jeff well I don't I don't know that I would have enough experience uh, to as well. it, but uh, you know I I think that it has a strong, I, I, I think uh, what Michael was saying, you know, there's a, there's a plateau. I think it has a strong following and, and, a, and a fan base. I don't think it's large and I don't think it's vast compared to things like, you know, comic books or vampires or those sorts of things. But I think it has its own little subsection of, of enthusiasts. Um, and, and, I, and the thing I find the, one of the strengths of the steampunk community is uh, they look for it, you know, they, they don't, um, and, and they're active, like it's a very, very active uh, group, especially, you know, especially we, one of the first uh, times I really got a taste of it, I was, I was at a comic book convention in Boston a few years ago, and um, the costuming was incredible. Uh, now, lots of great costumes, but the ones that really uh, were incredible were the steampunk costumes and the the amazing thing about it is you know that they didn't go down to the local costume shop and buy that mm -hmm. every bit of it was handcrafted and you know there's a real dedication and passion to that so as much as i, I don't feel like it's a growing um genre at this moment i don't i it could come again you know style changes um it, i think it's always just around the corner <laughs> yeah i i I'm probably coming from a different area because I'm part of the community as well. So what I've noticed is there was a bit of a peak in probably about 99, 2000 when Wild Wild West came out. And then there was another peak a bit later when they did probably about 2007, 8, when some TV shows cottoned onto it. Um, there was a, an episode of uh, Broken Wood Mysteries that last, last season, I think it was, that did a steampunk but they've got quite a big steampunk thing in New South, in New Zealand as well, very big over there. Um, what I've found is I, I went into it knowing it was a niche market. So I've, I've got other things I do as well. And sorry, there goes my clock. Um, and I've found that I tend to um, talk a lot and do stuff with the steampunk community. And I always find that they sort of go, yay, come here, go to our bookshop, uh, book, book club and stuff like that. And they are very much hands-on and very supportive. Yeah. And um, I've also noticed, and I don't know whether it's just because of COVID or whether it's because I'm part of the community, but mine was puttering along and I've actually been doing a little bit more sales in the last year. But then again, I've been doing more online events because of COVID. So um, I think, yes, it's plateaued out, but there's always going to be it's not trendy anymore, but it's always going to be that level of people there that will keep us, you know, reading us. <laughs> it's yeah. it's now now I call it a, a recognised sub sub genre, whereas ten years ago, fifteen years ago, it was new and startling, and there was a, a, a whole lot of people jumping on board. But now it's got its own momentum, and as you say, the aficionados will support steampunk and as look for it. Yeah, you'll never sell as much as Cozy Mysteries, but yeah, um, which I actually, one of the questions I had down here was, um, uh, well, steampunk at the moment, they didn't know where to stick us under science fiction or fantasy, and these days it tends to be science fiction. So, but in your opinion, is it science fiction or is it fantasy or both and why? Ha. I can start if you want what you want to think. <laughs> I'm going to say both. Um... For me, it's definitely science fiction. I came from a science fiction writing background. Um, I read it madly as a kid, just soaked it all in. And, and so inevitably, of course, as soon as I became a writer, I was writing science fiction. But there's a, a fantasy element too. Um, I don't have dragons. I don't have magic, but um, I have an alternative world, 
another version of Earth where the laws of physics are wildly different. And that is a kind of fantasy in a way. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's an interesting crossover, very hard to describe. For me, I uh, help if I talk. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm muted myself. <laughs> I, I was just going to say that uh, I came, I came to it I, via science fiction as well, and um, I would want to speak as say what it is for everyone because I do think that it exists uh, as both or even beyond that. Um, but I, I am definitely in this science fiction alternative history camp. Like I, uh, I, I, I'm, I like to, I like to have everything sort of tied into a, a certain amount of realism. I, I, we definitely try to um, do that in our in our books. Uh, it's got to, it's got to make a certain amount of logical sense. And because we are writing, uh, our book is theoretically taking place on earth uh, uh, in our own past. Uh, I'm, I'm very much tied to the, to some of the science of the day. Yeah. Um, when I Mark came to, uh, yeah, when I came to writing my steampunk series, uh, all steampunk was pretty much science fiction based. So I looked for a tweak, uh, looked for a wrinkle and instead wanted a, a fantasy base. So that's the laws of magic that you can see posted see behind me there. Uh, but being of a certain sort of uh, systematic frame of mind, I wanted my magic not to be sort of all over the place, uh, just wave your hands and stuff happen. I wanted to a, a rational base for magic. And so all of the magic is codified. It's a branch of science, essentially. And this sort of uh, this alt alternate earth, if you like, is in the 1890s when there's so much scientific advancement going on that helped to make the modern world. And so while that's going on, uh, parallel with that, they're breaking ground in magic and they're doing experiments and they're trying to come up with a, uh, an equivalent of a scientific method, but for magic. So that's the basis of the Laws of Magic series. Having done that, the next steampunk series I wrote was set, as Jeff was saying, was set in our world. So uh, yeah, magic sort of went to one side. It was a more science fiction basis. That was the Extraordinaire series set in 1910, which was the time of the first London Olympic Games, which is the background for the entire series. Lots of fun. Yeah. yeah. Um, I probably consider it more science fiction myself, although I, I do read a lot of gas lamp, so it's more into the fantasy end. It really depends on whether you bring in the supernatural and magic. Um, with mine, um, the first series particularly, I look at, I, I tend to set it in Victorian times. I've got some other ideas for other things. Um, and I, because of my uh, scientific background, I did a Bachelor of Applied Science and I've got lots of friends who are professors of this, that and the other thing. And I do remember the, the, the Susan, I don't know if she's listening, but um, she's now in the US, she's from Adelaide. She is professor of da, da, da. She actually said to me, for goodness sake, make the science believable or I'll get you. And so I've got all these people, <laughs> I've got all these people I can actually go, hey, um, I'm not good at this particular brand of science, would this work? Like I do um, flirt with the Victorian um, feelings of science, like they actually did think that octograms, which is taking a photo at the back of your eye, they actually believe that work. Now, of course, I did visual science. I know it doesn't exist. There's no such thing as, um, oh, I think it was called purple linear or something, anyway. Um, but they actually believed it it worked and i and i'll also be a big jack rip fan so my first book was about jack the ripper dr jack and they actually did try to use octograms to try to catch the ripper at one stage they had fingerprints but didn't use them they used tracker dogs at one stage and they actually did try and that was the basis is my character is an optician at the time funny that um and she actually tries to do it. Of course, it doesn't work. So I flirt with that level of uh, science because Vic the Victorian era was this lovely, it has a lot of bad things about it, uh, sexism, classism, colonialism, all that sort of stuff. But the bit I'd like to concentrate on is they had this amazing wonder of awe. They were on this cusp 
of scientific discoveries, but still believing that magic existed in a lot of cases. So that they were in this no man's land type thing, which is why spiritualism became such a big thing at the time. And so I love steampunk because I can do science or I can go the fantasy end and add in vampires if I want to. And I think that's the beauty is I think it's still mostly science fiction, but we can add in all those bits and it works. I've Yeah. So that's what I think. But yeah. Vampires? Horrors? No, not vampires. Do they sparkle in the sunlight? God, no. No sparkly vampires. <laughs> okay, so that actually brings me into another question. Um, okay, one, one from Bill again. How important is appearing at conventions for promoting your work? Anyone? Yep. Oh, yeah, yeah. Look, I'll just say it's important um, because of the community aspect as Karen was saying, that uh, getting out, talking to people, fleshing, pressing the flesh, uh, letting them know you're a real person, uh, that, that helps always. Um, of course, there are sometimes limited opportunities, but uh, you, you make of them what you will. I, I agree totally with you. I think um, uh, people like to know you're a real person and they can uh, identify with you more. And of course, especially the steampunk group that we were talking about before is very much a community. They'll accept lots of different people, but um, if you actually go in there and talk to them, they, I think they really appreciate that. So I actually enjoy being part of the community. Oh. So, Ged or uh, Jeff? Oh, uh, so I was going to say that the one and only time I did it, I did a book launch there. Michael was there. <laughs> Thank I you. Remember. Sorry about the hug. Um, <laughs> I get a bit huggy at times, but. Uh, <laughs> Um, it, and I think it, it really benefited me in book sales. But the thing is, on, on that book launch, I, I was there with the publisher. We had a table and we had these things on the table, you know, big piles of actual paper, you know, and it makes it real. People can walk up, they can pick up the book and go, wow, you know, and bam, they buy it. How the hell do you do it with a digital book? You know, I'm, I'm sort of feeling stuck between. What I would love with a convention is for anyone in Australia to wake up to the fact that I live here. You know, I used to be world famous somewhere else and that they could actually invite me onto their panels or something. And, and then I'd sort of be on the program and, and have a bit more sort of exposure that way. Hint, hint, anybody. Well, we, we have a steampunk convention down here in September. September? I'll be there for that. Just put, put me on the list, you know, and we'll see what we can do. Remind me later and I'll talk to Amanda about it. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, did you want to say anything, Jeff? Or? Well, yeah, I, I guess I would add that I, I definitely think that the... Now, we went to one convention in uh, 2019 in Connecticut and uh, my wife and I drove down and and it was a it was a terrific experience, and I, it's still reverberating because the connections we made there uh, are still some of them are still very strong uh, in my life. In fact, I, I I was texting with an author I met down there uh, last night uh, just to I, I was looking for a word, and I knew he would be the man who knows just such a word. And so I, I think that the conventions uh, and. Mm you know i think it doesn't matter whether it's steampunk or anything you need to meet your meet people to uh, implore them to read your book and we've uh, we've been thinking that uh as we continue to develop this uh series and business that we've noticed that where we live in the eastern uh northeast of uh, north america that there's a bit of a uh, uh community say from ontario East and New York North, where almost every small town has their own steampunk uh, group or club. And, you know, my wife and I have often discussed it would be absolutely a, a treat and, and within reasonable driving distance for us to just like do a whole tour and hit every one of them over, a, you know, a summer. Uh, and I, I swear there's got to be about 30 or 40 of them within you know two days drive of where we live uh you know it seems like every town has one yeah jeff, jeff yes can, yes can i just interrupt for a second jeff what what was the word oh i was i was i was looking for i was looking for a word to use uh in replace of of gene or genome yep oh, uh, yeah. right what did you come up with 
the nucleon. So do you find you're doing the same thing where you you get a word and you go, that's too modern, it didn't come into existence until after X and you have to go back and find another word? I do that all the time. Uh, you know, if, if, it, if, it, if it didn't exist, I can't use it. I, I'm yeah. just, stuck, I'm stuck that um, way. You yeah. can Google Ngram, which I've just messaged, N-G-R-A-M, Google mm -hmm. that. And it actually gives you all the different words in written print from time. So I actually go back and you can see how commonly it was used oh. as well. That's another thing as well. Yeah. So it's um, dictionaries of etymology and that sort of yes. thing. And yeah. there's even the Oxford Historical Thesaurus, which Ooh. does phrases from and gives you the first time that they appeared in print and when they were used through the years. Uh, so, yeah, that's on my wish list because it's sort of five or six hundred dollars. Uh, oh, OK. I've written it down, but it'll be a while. Um, on, online been... resources, online resources, yes. anything you know about, just just post them up and we'll grab <laughs> on. Um, on that um, point, I, I try to be very conscientious of the words I'm using and um, I never use, I never have a character saying, OK. Oh. Really careful with that. <laughs> totally avoid oh, it. Right. The other one, the other word I love to use is gay. They were in a very gay mood. Happy. <laughs> so we're happy. Yeah. yeah I, just I, I, missed, I missed what you said. What was your first word that you say you never used? Okay. okay. When did it come around? Well, the it history of World War II, I think. It was World War II. No, 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 there, no. But it sounds modern. The history of OK is that it goes back to 1780s. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I'm it sticking, sounds I'm modern. I'm to my guns. It sounds modern. No matter how it old it is, it sounds modern. It way too modern, modern, I know. So I, I avoid OK thing. at all times. <laughs> yeah. Now, you said something before. Within physical driving, dis easy driving distance. Ha! Huh, you're talking to <laughs> people in Australia. We have a lot of conventions, but I'm in Adelaide right bang in the middle of Australia, which is mm -hmm. like being in the middle of America or Canada. And then you've got the closest ones uh, uh, like way on the East Coast or like I flew over to New Zealand last year. <laughs> so we're a bit envious probably that you can do that. <laughs> we are well located with, with you know, kind of, uh, we're, 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 we're relatively the same distance from Toronto as we are from New York, which would be about, uh, say safe 16 hour drive yeah so it's, that's uh, a big range yeah uh, distances i've got a friend who lives in europe and he can drive for an hour and go through five uh, countries yeah. i've got a friend who lives in the northern territory of australia he goes he can drive for an hour and get to his letterbox <laughs> uh, um i used to live in the country in queensland and you had to drive for about 15 minutes to get to the the we had a whole row of letterboxes for the area and uh, yeah um okay so um we were talking about all sorts of things we're talking about some stuff about um when steampunk was of course so uh, we do a little bit on world building and setting um there's been a few pan panels earlier on in the litcon about building worlds for science fiction and fantasy genres as a history geek i love doing the research so i'm actually do alternate history i have the history like Jack the Ripper or whoever and then I go what if this happened and I flip it a bit so I'm lucky I've got a lot of the world there already and I incorporate historical characters um how, how do you go about it we'll talk about tropes in a minute so don't worry how, how how do you think steampunk differs what it's not, this is the thing where not just stick a cog on it and call it steampunk. That's the whole thing about this one is what do you think you need to add or what do you think you see in a story that you go, ah, that's steampunk. And I know, I probably know what Ged's gonna say. So. <laughs> say it, Ged, say it, Ged. <laughs> You've been telling me all the things, you wanna talk about airships. Oh, I did, I did wanna talk about these things here, so world building, okay. <laughs> Um, I, um, I'm a bit of a pantser and I sort of just started, you know, I, I had the germ of the idea for these other guys that were trying to develop this game. By the way, they were um, Texas State University students, they're all about 18, 19 and 20 years old and about three months after they started this thing, their course material, their exams, their, their uh, assignments piled on and they just sort of vanished, but I was left with this, this um, momentum. So there was the idea that the airships are traveling between little sort of 
blobs of land that float up in the sky. So the first thing is, what on earth would cause a lump of landscape to just float up in the in the sky? The next thing is, you know, does it grow trees? What's the what's the atmospheric conditions around this thing? You know, and I thought, well, at summertime, this would act as a sort of a, a thermo chimney effect. It would heat up in the sun and would be pulling the air from below. There'd be thunderstorms around it all the time and rain and stuff. So airships only travel in winter. And it was like, bang, of course, it would have to be something like that. How do these people eat, you know, if they farm the whole top of it, it's only like eight and a half square miles across the top, you know, that's not a lot of farm to keep a city going. So they're obviously going to be having to transport their food in. And, and if the whole landscape, the entire world is made of these little floating things and no one has enough farmland, well, how do they feed themselves, you know? So, okay, they have to travel down to the normal surface where it's much more landscape and more farming is possible. And then they have to figure out a way of getting the airships to go up and down because you can only go so high in an airship if you know your physics and then you're limited. You explode or you rip open and you get down, you go crash. So all of these things had to come into my world building, which, and then the next thing is that there's all these little islands floating around there and there's sort of a, a, a day's travel between each other. What's the politics? Is there a king here and a queen there and a, you know, an, an evil emperor here and so on and so on. So each little skyline has its own sort of characteristics, its own language. And then, okay, if everybody's got their own language, it's going to be hell. So they've got to have a global language like English has become now. And so I thought, all right, there's going to be an empire. And sort of two or 300 years ago, they just got into the airships and they were very militarized. And they went around and they captured all the other islands and you know, colonized them and imposed their own language. All of these things went into my, just because I had things floating around, but it opened up all of these possibilities too. You know, There's a lot of interesting possibilities in terms of storytelling here, because you, all you have to do is take your characters land them on a new skyland, as they call them, and they've got a whole new set of characters to interact with, a whole new sort of physics to interact with, and so on and so on. So infinite number of stories open up from this. And um, I had a lot of fun thinking about it. Just the physics. You made up whole new worlds. Yeah. Uh, yeah, entirely. Yeah. It's, it's an alternative Earth where something happened about, you know, 28 million years ago, and I'm not going to tell you the spoilers, but um, <laughs> a whole lot of metamaterials fell onto into, and embedded themselves into the planetary surface and that these metamaterials which sort of exist in multiple dimensions at once can sort of cause all of these interesting new physics to go on so there's no magic here it's, it's pure science once you understand it so yeah that was a tremendous and then the final thing was culture if this is set in sort of 1870 or something you know what like we said what's the attitudes towards women what's the attitudes towards other races people with different skin colors and stuff and I haven't gone deeply into it. I haven't made them really horrible, but I've hinted here and there that there's a racism, there's sexism, there's, there's um, colonialism that's been happening and um, we, we interact with that as the stories. Yeah. Gonna talk about the punk a bit later in a minute, yeah. So Jeff, what do you, what, what, sorry? Well, I'm finished. Okay, so Jeff, um, what do you think would be uh, with the world building? How different was it to do science fiction? Uh, sorry, to do steampunk, and what do you think is something that you go all that steampunk? Well, hmm. I uh, mine evolved slowly out of an idea that you know there was a there was initial seed, and much like the idea of you know you have these two floating islands and it and and and, and everything spawns out from that. My original sort of uh, concept was, um, I don't know if anybody here is familiar with uh, Charles Fort, um, who was, I see a smile, good. Um, so uh, Charles Fort was the, the arguably the world's first paranormal investigator. And, uh, and he was based out of New York, though he spent uh, time in London and, and in other places. And, uh, you know, is generally seen as a strange little man who spent most of his life, you know, curled up in libraries, reading journals from around the world, uh, making, you know, making notes on little pieces of paper and, and creating really one of the first databases in some ways of paranormal and strange things. And so uh, around the time that uh, we were dealing with this idea, my family was a fan of a show called the Murdoch Mysteries. Um, I don't know if. Okay, so you're familiar, and my favorite. 
<laughs> it's a great show. <laughs> and we used to kind of bat around the idea was, you know, I, I love a lot of elements of that show. Like, uh, and I thought it would be very interesting if, if taking this sort of procedural drama, but move it over to something more akin to the X-Files, you know, where someone is discovering all of these things for the first time before their tropes. Uh, and 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 seeing the world through that those eyes so this became the 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 groundwork for what eventually became uh a steampunk a steampunk uh layered world um i don't want to oversell the amount of steampunk we it's it's very subtle in our books uh in some ways i mean we do have an airship but like for example our airship is is the result of that was just the popular design of the day he it's actually a, a ufo but nobody has an idea of what a ufo should look like so when you build your own you you model it after what you think things should look like yeah. um and those were the you know the the parts that were around um so there's some of these sorts of elements where we we justify how we bring a little bit of steampunk in here and a little bit in there and in my our version of fort uh, we're trying to we're trying to tell the secret history of Charles Fort, the one that the world no longer knows, um, and that he wasn't he wasn't just in libraries doing research. He was actually out in the field uh, with his best friend Charles uh, Robert Ripley from Ripley's Believe It or Not, and the two of them are out uh, ex exploring and and trying to find proof of the paranormal. Uh, so that's that's sort of how we're we're bringing it in and. I love with each book, we get to find new ways to kind of, again, like I said, this has always been a part of my life. So I'm always looking for ways to bring this sort of thing in. Now you spoke about not using much gadgets and I, I, I'm similar sort of thing. I do have airships and trains and mad scientists and secret societies and an armored corset because you know, there is a written documentation of a woman in New Zealand who got shot and was wearing a corset. Apparently <laughs> it happened once, but anyway. <laughs> Um, so there's lots and lots of tropes. Um, I don't use a lot of, I have gadgets, but in my world, Queen Victoria had something horrible happen to her as a, a, when she was younger. And so she's not really keen on gadgets. She thinks that she has to appropriate them to, to protect the general populace. And that's one of the things that my character is miffed about. She can't see why everyone can't have access to um, gadgets and stuff like that. So I call my gadget light. Um, so oh, it was an end of a question for you to use any particular tropes. And the other part of it is um, we'll start after we talk about tropes, we'll talk about the punk part of it. And we've got about 15 minutes left. So we'll do that at the moment. And I'm just looking. Yep. OK. There's a question to ask at the end as well. So first of all, um, do you particularly like quickly um, use any particular tropes that are common that most people will think of? I use them all. I, uh, I just, I'm a writer, you know, I never thought about it until I discovered TV tropes and then suddenly, oh my God, I do that. Yeah. And then I'm just like everything, it's all in there. I don't actually consciously think about it very much. Yep. And Michael? Yeah. Look, part of what makes a genre a genre are the tropes or, or especially in steampunk terms, it's the trappings, the trappings that make it recognizably steampunk. You take them out and it's not steampunk anymore. But my mm -hmm. approach to steampunk is very much through the lens of history and history provides a foundation and the framework. And because I've written two separate steampunk series, one is set in an alternate world where I can fudge the facts and change things around. The other set in our world where historical events are historical events, you can't move them around. But uh, either is fun, but it, if it doesn't have a top hat in it, is it steampunk? Wow. Yeah. I hope so because I have no top hat yet. <laughs> oh, well, I've got a coaching hat and that's why I'm wearing my bowler. It's purple. So. Bowlers are lovely too. I went out and bought a top hat uh, when I was writing my first yeah. series. I went to a Melbourne hat shop that is an institution. It's been where it is since 1910. And it's still selling today. I went in and it was just before the Melbourne Cup, a big horse race here, uh, Jeff. And I said, do you have top hats? And they pulled back a curtain and said, have we got top hats? There were racks and racks of them. The best one, the one I wanted was $2,600. So I, oh, yeah. I, dialed, I dialed my ambition back after that. That was a bit beaver skin, was it? <laughs> beaver uh, it, was, it was 
the Austrian silk, apparently. <gasps> When, yeah. when I was working, I bought a two hundred dollar one, but that's as much as I could go. So uh, uh, quickly, Jeff, what do you what tropes do you put in? Or well, I, I I love tropes, and and a lot of our our book is about exploring paranormal tropes. But in the same vein with our our steampunk tropes, it's about taking these tropes and turning them inside out a bit, so okay. that the the you get to you get to use you get to benefit from the the the, the trope itself but you present it in a way that hopefully no one has ever considered it before. Yeah, okay. So we've talked a bit about tropes. Um, that, so that's the steam part of it. And then you've got the punk part of it, which um, I was trying to explain to someone the other day. So like classic science fiction, you, well, it still does, but it was more so before, it shines a light on how society treats women, people of color, LGBTIQ, and the people on the fringes. And that's happening a lot in um, a lot of steampunk writing. Um, I'm, I often read, write particularly about how women are treated and I'm actually trying to organise a, a meeting with a local elder because I want to use an Indigenous character in, in one of my new uh, upcoming books. So how do you add punk to your steam and um, do you use sensitivity readers? Or you hadn't thought about that one? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but that, that whole business of because the Victorian Edwardian era was so classist, I, I tend to take a Dickens approach in that there are grubby streets, there are shabby streets, there are the downtrodden underprivileged. And doesn't matter where my character comes from, uh, my characters will need to be aware of the inequities in that society. And all of my characters are crusade. My, my main characters are crusaders at heart. They crusade in all sorts of direction. And one of the things they're trying to do, they inevitably end up uh, crusading for the oppressed, trying to do something to change the way society is, uh, is keeping those people in awful condition. Uh, that, that, that's a central concern of mine in all of my stories. Anyone else? Uh, um, well, I, to answer your last question first, I'm fortunate enough. I don't need a sensitivity writer. My, I, my, like I said, I work, I co-write with my wife, and she has 15 years experience working in that field uh, herself. So we have that lens on on things uh, consistently throughout it. But um, some of the fun things that I, that that I like to do to again take these tropes and turn them upside down would be an example of in our new book we're we're introducing this ancient order uh, a Masonic esque uh, uh, organization that is all women and it's it's existed secretly without anyone knowing it's there because no one would ever bother to look of a. Uh, 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 a, a, a league of librarians who have a network around the world, uh, protecting the world's most important knowledge. And uh, I, we'd also like to, we're, there's always to try and bring in, you know, people of different cultures and things into the book, whenever, whenever you have the opportunity, I think it's great to take it and, and develop those characters in, in their culture. Um, I think that, that that adds a richness to, to these books. Yep. Um. <clears throat> Right, so we've got about 10 minutes left. So um, uh, Bill's asking, uh, I'm just going to share a link in a minute um, for you guys. If you can go and put your um, contact details, website addresses on the, the page, which I'm just trying to work out to do. Sure. He also had a question. Uh, okay, and I'll get you guys to start on this question while I do a few things and come back to it. Um, he asked, what are your predictions for steampunk fiction, trends in themes and subject matter, and or trends in the market in the next five years? So which, which way do you think steampunk is going to go as far as um, subject matter and themes? Um, I'm, I'm going to optimistically predict that the Ged Mabry will become very, very popular and successful. <laughs> 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 Beyond that, uh, I'm, I'm no expert at this. I would like to think that it, it keeps evolving. Um, it finds new ways to express um, contemporary ideas set in the same kind of timescape. And um, it, it just stays healthy, really. Yeah. Uh, if, if I had to make a prediction, um, here's my prediction. If, uh, uh, as they continue to uh, mine 
comic books for great ideas for films someone will eventually find lady mechanica which is a brilliant steampunk uh adventure comic uh someone's gonna find that they'll make a motion picture and suddenly we're all gonna be uh riding a wave again much like uh, the league of extraordinary right, I here and i don't know why so I okay i see the Sorry. future for steampunk is a, a continuing trend that's already begun it's broadening it out from its uh, Western centric view of that period, uh, moving out into more Japanese steampunk, more Chinese, Asian based steampunk, Indian steampunk. Their railway system was extraordinary. And of course, Australian and Pacific steampunk. And that Afro steampunk, there's a tiny nascent movement for that. And I'd like to see that continue the whole business of broadening it out from its Western origins. It's um, starting to happen, thank goodness. There's quite a few yep. um, steampunk people in the um, South America, India, uh, Africa-based ones as well, um, yep. coming from people from there, plus also other people riding in that. Uh, Weird, Weird West is big in the US. Yep, happening. Um, there's quite a bit of Asian too. And um, of course, uh, a lot of my short stories have been based in, in Australia. My Cozy Mysteries in Adelaide, the first book, um, the first series was in England because at the time they were saying, don't write in Australia, no one wants to read it. <laughs> um, uh, and by the end of the, this, this one, um, at the end, they actually end up in Australia and the second book is mostly in Australia because I actually want to write more steampunk in Australia. Um, <clears throat> also, you're getting a lot more people of colour writing and people, LGBTIQ people, writing stories from their point of view too. So I think that's a big thing that's starting to happen. Um, from what I can see, there's a few other things, but I can't just put my finger on them right now. So what about you, Jeff? Um, I, I don't know. I, did, I guess maybe the last thing I said wasn't heard. Is that what you said? Sorry? Um, uh, uh, can you still hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, okay. Yes. I'm just uh, going a bit deaf. So oh. the question was, uh, from Bill was, what are your predictions for steampunk fiction trends and themes and subject matter? or trends in the market in the next five years? Well, I, I, what I would like to say is if they decide to uh, continue to troll comic books for movie products and they discover Lady Mechanica, then <laughs> they make that movie, we'll all, be, uh, we'll all be at the front of the bookshelves again, uh, just like happened with Wild Wild West and the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen and those yeah. sorts of products. Yeah. Yeah. Until uh, yeah. that happens, though, we're going to be toiling in obscurity. I have a confession to make. I, I gate crashed a children's um, book presentation here in one of the local libraries because the top dude, and his name's just gone out of my head, the top dude from Weta Workshops was there. The guy that won the Oscar, and he was presenting, and then they the staff members from the library spotted me and they tried to throw me out. So I said, all right, and I walked up, I introduced myself, I handed my proposal to him and said, I've got a few ideas for steampunk, I reckon, where to workshop. And, um, and uh, oh God, the, the very famous Peter Jackson, I think uh, you and Peter Jackson could really make a great steampunk thing. And he said, okay, I'll have a look at that. And I got an email a little bit later, said, thanks for your proposal, but we've already got something underway for ourselves. And it we was. haven't seen it yet. Uh, didn't he do, um, oh, Dave, what's the, Mortal Engines? Perhaps. Oh, maybe they was talking about that. Yeah, he did do that it thing. Yeah, it was Peter Jackson. So that's only just come out, what, last year, the year before? A couple of so years yeah, ago now. Maybe that was it. Time for another one. <laughs> we need more. Okay. okay. I'll get so in touch with my pro, Peter. Yeah, technically, yeah. we've got four minutes left theoretically, and I there's a new couple of new comments. Okay, so I've, uh, for the people watching, I've actually shared for the authors in the Zoom thing over there, um, I've shared a link for you to go to um, after, and if you can put your um, links and your contact details in there for them. Yeah, Does it that won't, make sense? won't let us, Karen. I just went to the Facebook page and it won't let me put, uh, make oh, my okay. details. Right, okay. Um, if you uh, message it to me, I, I've shared Jeff's stuff. Sure. If you message them to me, I'll put them on the other thing for you. Thank okay, you. Okay, so we, 
I'm just checking quickly for any more questions. No, we've done that one. Opportunity. Sorry. I should yes. take this opportunity. Oh, we're going to get there. That's the next thing. Is I'm going to say quickly to everyone, what's your latest release and what are you currently writing? Go, Jeff. Well, I'm. This is uh, this is our first book, Terra Obscura, Knock in the Dark. It's an introduction to our world, and we have a second uh, book out. I don't know if you can see this print in the back here. This is this is the co cover of our second book, Falling Against Gravity, and we're working on our third book, hopefully to be released uh, this year or sometime. Uh, we're kind of, you know, we're taking our time with it because we want to have a, a a very successful book launch, and and for that to happen, we need this pandemic sort of. Uh, in the bag behind us. So that's that's what we're working on right now to get our third book out. And Michael, it doesn't have necessarily have to be steampunk. <laughs> sure. Yeah, look, my last two books are these two, uh, Gap Year in Ghost Town and Graveyard Shift in Ghost Town. These are set in good old Melbourne, Australia. They're young adult, but don't let that fool you. These are, they, I call these the book for everyone. And they are funny, spooky, ghost hunting adventures. And I had a lot of fun writing them. They made me laugh, so I hope they make people laugh as well. So it's a case of uh, who you're going to telegram. Ghostbusters. <laughs> are, you, are you working on anything at the moment yet, or are you just republishing re your um, past ones as ebooks? Uh, I spent last year writing a stage play which is in the Monty Miller at the moment. I don't know whether I've won yet. Uh, I would like to write some more, but I'm kind of waiting for some feedback from readers, you know, like I want to hear some people saying, oh, I read the whole series and I got to the end. I love it. I haven't heard that yet. And I think that will re-stimulate me to do the next six books in the series. I mean, they're kind of planned in here as much as I plan anything, uh, just like some feedback, some, some encouragement. Do you want to say anything, Sharon? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Hemi Soames and the Water available as an ebook now, as well as print. And um, and I'm working on some short stories for anthologies. And my next book will be a fantasy. Then I'll go back and do some sequels to Hemi. Cool. Um. I, I'm currently writing um, my my second book in the Antina Mysteries, which is a cosy fantasy mystery set in Adelaide. And the second one's actually in 1920 when Arthur Conan Doyle visited Adelaide. And then after that, I'll be going back to working on the second Department of Curiosities, um, which, as I said, is mostly set in Australia. So that's probably what I'm going to be doing next. Anyone else? That's everyone is not good. Okay. And um, da 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 da. And how can we contact you? Uh, I've put a few links across, but if you can actually tell people. And do you have Patreon? Okay, I'll put something over in a minute. Let me figure do, out how to. Do, do, do you know what your link is offhand? My link to, to okay, the- so uh, it gets on Facebook. He's also on Facebook. So you can find him on Facebook and you can see his picture, he's wearing his pink top hat uh, that that's that's a cowboy hat actually yeah oh, there you so, go. So, for the purposes here it's a top hat yes definitely is your website um current working or is it mostly facebook you're doing at the moment yeah uh i i have a blog um i i have two or three identities on facebook and fairly easy to find um i have a blog called steamed up so people can find me there and message me there if they want i'm on wikipedia Look, I'm everywhere, baby. And what about you, Michael? I know you're on a few places, including Instagram, because I see you quite a lot there. Oh, yeah. Yep. I keep up a regular social media presence. Yep. So Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, easy to find. My website is www.michaelpryor.com.au. Uh, but uh, just Google me. You'll find me. Yeah, yeah you're, you're on all sorts of things. You're on Wikipedia as well. What about you, Jeff? Uh, no, no Wikipedia yet for me, but maybe someday. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <That'd> be nice. <laughs> our, our books can be found anywhere good books are sold. And uh, also we have a website, which would be a portal for people uh, to either learn more about them or, or find a link to where to buy them. And it could be uh, found at www.terra-obscura-chronicles.com. Yep. Um, 
Sharon, do you want to um, say where you're at or do you want me to say what you just put? She's at... You say, please. Okay. She's at S-M Kemet, K-E-M-M-E-T-T, -T, the word Taylor. And you can find her um, on, she's got a webpage and she's on Facebook as well. And um, I've got my Patreon up there. So you can actually, I'm Karen J. Carlyle on Patreon. Um, and I'm on www.karenjcarlyle.com. Nice and easy to remember. And if you're reading anyone's books, please remember to leave reviews or go and find them on Patreon and leave them because, that's not me um because we, we write and write and write and that's well, some of us that's the only income we have um and you know those poor writers like being reviewed yeah <laughs> any other questions i can see i can see that uh, rich is coming on he's gonna shook us away soon any other things you want to say i'm just having a quick look bill says thank you for answering the questions and I've got some links and I've put them on um, the, the page, uh, but I'll also put them on the other one as well when we're finished. I'd just like to say, because uh, the last one of these forums I did, we got abruptly cut off. So I just want to say it was really a pleasure meeting you all. And this has been a lot of fun. And uh, I yes. will be looking you up uh, on the internet tomorrow. I'm going to bed now. <laughs> oh, yeah, because it's like, it's, um, night, it's only on 2.30 p.m. here for me. And I think it's free for uh, Michael. What time is it in Queensland? <laughs> Two o'clock, roughly. Two o'clock. So what time is it that where you are, um, Jeff? Uh, midnight. Oh, poor thing. Okay. <laughs> and that's probably why Richard's looking a bit tired as well. Are you going to chop us off soon, Richard? <laughs> so I want to thank I've, you. I, I've had a five-hour energy, energy drink and a monster. I'm ready to rock. <laughs> so I think that's our hour coming up. So I want to thank Michael. I'm going and out partying now. Yeah. You get with these glasses. And Jeff and Sharon for popping in as well. And I'm Karen J. Carlyle. And um, it looks like Richard is going to kick us off. Thank you, Karen. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Karen. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Uh, and right. I'll share Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Sharon, for popping in and saying some things. Bye. Bye. Okay, I'm leaving. <laughs>